Welcome to the Expert Pod. My name is James. I'm your host. Uh, I'm a Brit living in Sweden, as you probably already know. And I'm here today with my lovely guest, Evangeline Duncan, or Evie. And Evie's actually my girlfriend. So I don't know if you want to introduce yourself to the world or to the five listeners. <laughs> and uh, it's very... Hi! Yeah. <laughs> so you're a bit by yourself. Yes. Okay, hello. Uh, thank you, James. Yes, uh, my name's Evie and I'm an actress. Uh, living in England and currently spending quite a lot of time in Sweden visiting my lovely boyfriend James. <laughs> so if you're not watching and you're just listening, you just look behind his shoulder. Um, and before I set up living in uh, London, I went and lived in France for three months when I was doing a preliminary acting course in preparation for going to drama school. So that was my experience of living abroad. Welcome to section one of the podcast, all about getting there. So this is where we kind of ask the guest a bit about how they manage to, to live abroad or experience life in the country. Um, so Evie, I know you've lived both, or lived in France for a little bit of time and spent a lot of time here in Sweden. So just tell me a bit about how you, how you got to each location. I guess the main difference between the two places uh, is the fact that one was pre-Brexit and one was post-Brexit. So getting to France, I was there for a 12-week course, or 11 weeks, so it came under the, a three-month time span. And pre-Brexit, obviously, we were able to go into any country in Europe and spend... Free movement of labour. Yeah, exactly. And spend uh, up to three months there without needing any kind of visa any reason to be there um and obviously I wasn't working because I was doing a I was on for a student, student reason um to studying exactly so to get to France uh my uh, parents actually drove me <laughs> over to France um and uh so we packed up the car uh with a lot of my stuff and took the Euro tunnel and we spent a couple of days uh traveling all together um looking at a few different places along the way to get to Fontainebleau which is where the course was that doing with uh, Fontainebleau School of Acting or Fonact and they're about 40 minutes outside of Paris. Mm. So, But how did you actually get to Fontainebleau School? Oh, like, like uh, what, sorry, was the, what was the reason, the reason for going? going? Um, so the reason that I went to the school was because I spent summer after graduating from university in uh, 2015. Uh, I had this the summer before deciding what I was going to do for the rest of my life um, and I had studied psychology but I really knew that I still wanted to give acting a shot and so I kind of thought to myself this month these summer months are maybe an opportunity to see if that's still a, a bug worth mm. discovering um, and so I did the three-week acting course at Guildhall and lo and behold still loved doing acting and still thought I do want to pursue this uh, career so deciding okay what am I going to do after this three-week course uh, one of the teachers on on the summer school had uh, approached a couple of the students who were on the summer school mm -hmm. and said that he had this school in France which he was setting up and uh, the starting in October 2015 mm -hmm. that was going to be the first go at having a three-month long course previously he'd only ever done two-week summer schools and he wanted to expand the school into having a offering a three-month course mm -hmm. and so he invited some students to be a part of that for the first time and the school is amazing um just as a side note they've since that time they've expanded to now have a i think they still do the three-month course and the summer school but now they do a year-long acting course two year and i think now three and they've oh. even expanded to have both a campus in France but also in Greece they're doing the thing uh, at the moment so they're doing very very well which is wonderful little seed grown into a fantastic <laughs> oak tree um but yeah so that's how I ended up uh decided to go for this three month uh, uh acting school amazing and how did you get to Sweden <laughs> um <laughs> but obvious ones. yeah um well uh, because of you, I guess. So <laughs> that was, uh, well, yes. Uh, so getting to Sweden was very much just seeing how it would go, being with you for 
I think I was there for six weeks, wasn't I? Yeah, six weeks after getting to Spain first. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so after you moved in August 2022, yeah. I then joined you in September. And this was obviously pro- post-Brexit, so mm-hmm. a bit of a different experience in that now you, you can only be in a Schengen country for 90 out of 180 days. So within six months, that's Yeah, not months. for work. Yeah, if you're not there for work, and I can't work here without being on a work visa. Um, and so I decided to join you for six weeks, mm. which is what it was like living in Gothenburg in that time, which was an interesting experience. Whenever you go anywhere, I think, be it in your own country, be it moving abroad, anything, there really needs to be a pull for going that's... It's wonderful to go uh, and be with your partner. But I think if you're doing anything like that, there needs to be a reason to go that's for yourself mm-hmm. and something that's going to occupy your time and be something fulfilling for you. And I think for me, working in acting and therefore being very much uh, freelance and finding my own working day mm-hmm. in, and spending a lot of that time alone, it can be very isolating. So I think whenever you're moving, if you're moving abroad, for example, being able to find community be it at work mm. competition work in extracurricular activities in perhaps finding groups that you can join finding classes to do and that's really important for your mental health and for sanity it's a sense of independence if you're going as a couple yeah or to meet someone or to join someone in somewhere else you need to have your own life mm. as we've discovered it can be difficult for me to <laughs> To navigate, let alone, and I have friends and friends here now because of my work. Um, whereas for you, you, know, you haven't got the luxury of meeting people in the office or in a work environment. You need to you know, somehow have that kind of connection, which is difficult. Yeah, we can discuss that a bit more in depth in the next section of being there. But um, we're, both from France and Sweden, were there any prerequisites you needed before you moved? So accommodation, obviously. You stay with me here, but for France, how was the accommodation situation? Pretty simple and easy going for me because I was going with a with the prospect of going to a school. Mm. They were very good at making sure that the accommodation was sorted for us. So I actually stayed with um, Laurent, who's the head of the school, with uh, his auntie and uncle. Mm-hmm. Uh, there were three of us lodging in this beautiful house that they lived in because they lived. Uh, Monday to Friday in Paris, mm. and then to come to Fontainebleau on the weekends. Dream, uh, and so we were living there uh, in that uh, in in that house uh, for the majority of the time, mm. the whole time. Sorry, and that was the case for all of the students there. They were all living in family. Mm. Home so the community so it community really it. was yeah an incredible uh, pull on resources of the community of being in um, in, in that town. Is that well changed? Obviously, you said the school's grown. Have they invested in building around accommodation, or have they? Is it all... I don't know. I, I don't know what they do now because they have a much larger cohort as well. When mm. we did it, there was only fourteen of us studying, um, mm. so obviously a much more manageable number. So I don't know what they do now if they have a similar setup or perhaps similar to Airbnb. Yeah, the ones in touch with people. It, who would be renting out there? Because even like a two year courses or three year courses, it's a lot of time for people to, it is. And to I, give up a house. And I don't know if um, if it's open to UK residents to do the one or two year course. I, I don't know, but it might be that. Well, it'd be the same as going abroad for university, but it's still possible to do, but you can get a student visa and mm. it's anyone who's able to, to study in the country, I guess. Yeah, I guess they probably just have to jump through some more hoops. Yeah. Than we did. Any more information you want to share about how you got to either Sweden or UK or to France um, for things you had to do before you left? Or did you oh. know who you were living with before you moved? Oh, um... Obviously me, you knew. But... <laughs> <laughs> but had you spoken to, you said you were living with two of the girls, yes. two of the people, sorry, yeah. um, in, in France. Did you know them before? Had you spoken to them before? What was the situation? With them? I, I knew one of them because she'd been on the course with me in Guildhall. So that was really great getting to live with her. But I'd only known M for three weeks prior, mm-hmm. um, and we hadn't lived together beforehand. But Laurent put us together, which was great. And then he put us with uh, another 
uh, one of my very good friends now, um, Oyani, who we had, had, sorry, she had also done the course, uh, but I didn't know her, so we were all just sort of thrust together, but it was the best thing to happen on that course because we, the three of us really became a unit and mm. a real support system for each other because it was an incredibly taxing, challenging, enlightening mm -hmm. time and very emotional. And, you know, you go through with everything that you do when you're stretching yourself. Um, it was a, 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 a very um, exposing mm -hmm. time. And, it, and with the growth comes all of the like, growing pains, I guess. So having two of my very good friends there to sort of support us through it. And actually the, the group, as I was saying, only 14 of us, was actually a really, really special group because it was such a, a small, tight-knit um, unit. Mm -hmm. We support each other through the experience because it wasn't just doing drama school which you know if anything it's the top of drama schools it can be quite um quite a, an exposing time it was also everyone was living abroad mm -hmm. apart from uh, some of the people were french but they were still had moved mm -hmm. into that situation and um you know you're thrown into these scenarios where you have to be extremely vulnerable with other people who you don't really know that well but you kind of have to build this level of trust um, so yeah, getting to have those people that I was living with was really great because we'd already built that kind of um, roommate mm -hmm. friendship and then we were also working together. So that was really great. Amazing. Welcome to section two of the podcast. What well, being that now you've already given a bit of information about uh, obviously your social life in France and, and your friends and things and um, I guess this is a section that covers a lot of that, a lot of just your first impressions of each location and basically just day to day life, if anything funny has happened. So let's start with France then. So what were, what were your first impressions when you, when you arrived? Well, what did you do? Did you go straight to the house you're living in? Did you go to the school? Straight to the house to unpack everything mm. uh, and yeah, check in, I guess. And I think I arrived on either the Saturday or the Sunday, I can't remember now, we were starting on Monday morning, so I had a little bit of time before beginning the school, but it was a really full-on experience, so mm -hmm. there wasn't a lot of time for experiencing where I was living, apart from a little bit in the evenings and mainly on the weekends. Of course, we were there in October to December, so dark evenings as well, so you're spending so much time out and about exploring. <laughs> But we were in this very beautiful location. Fontainebleau has this amazing chateau, and um, it's where Marie Antoinette would go to sort of summer to her country lodge. <laughs> a lot of the time was obviously spent in school, and it well, it didn't feel like a hindrance at all, as if I was missing out on exploring. It just meant that the weekends could be full of looking around the town and also travelling into Paris, which was really like what a privilege to get to go to Paris in like half an hour I think it was on the train. Super convenient. Very yeah. Uh, we even went to Disneyland on one of the trips over uh, one of the weekends. Oh I'm really sorry about this <laughs> and uh your mishap with driving. Oh gosh yeah. Oh do I? I don't know. Well So then watching people <laughs> it's all her fault. No it was not her fault. <laughs> Basically the three of us rented a car to for, for the weekend so that we could go to Disneyland Paris and we drove, drove drove there, I think it was on a Sunday, drove there in the morning, all absolutely wonderful. It was a Christmas special period of time, so, uh, you know, the float uh, parade was even better than mm. a regular Disney experience. And at the end of the day, we'd watched the fireworks, had a wonderful day, we set off, and this was to get back to the house, and this was pre- having Google Maps just readily available mm. on your phone. Or maybe it wasn't, maybe it was just that the internet wasn't working. Can't, can't quite remember. But basically, we took the wrong turn mm -hmm. and we ended up on completely the wrong highway and we were heading towards a toll. And we thought, we didn't go through a toll on the way here. <laughs> we think, oh, we're going wrong. But of course, we get to the toll booth mm -hmm. and you can't exactly turn around. So we had to go through and pay this mm -hmm. toll. And then we were just starting to panic, thinking, what the hell are we going to do? And uh, on the side of the road, I see these policemen that I just said to Em, stop, just just, just let stop, and we're going to have to clean the ignorance and be like, we need help right now. So I rolled down the window. And granted, at this point, I'm, my friend, she's pretty okay, but I was in such a panic that I was like, we're just going straight in with the ignorance. 
right and I was just like do you speak English like, yes I was like what's my other loss we're trying to get to Fontainebleau can you help us oh, and he was very very sweet so yes that's my um you're going the wrong way he was like granted you've got that thanks and he told us what to do but what that meant was that they had to shut the entire road <laughs> stop all the traffic so that we could turn around and go back through the tunnel <laughs> to get on the other side so it cost us you know like 12 euros and a dignity but we got home at the end a lot later than schedule but you know that was the tale to tell so yeah so a lot lots of fun at the weekends basically and a lot of exploring of the, the town which is beautiful mm. we went to a lovely village which is next door called Bapam Molot um which was a really real treat village it's sort of stepping back in time to 16th century I feel like it's yeah gorgeous so that took up a lot, a lot of my time being there, but also getting to really be immersed in the culture of it as, at the same time. Mm. It's because we had, we you know, did have French people on the course. It was an international course. It was all in English. So we were, had uh, Italian, Sicilian, Spanish, American, English, Danish, real eclectic mix. Mm-hmm. And within the time that we were outside of the course hours, but obviously in Fontainebleau, which is, you know, it's, it's a town in France, it's not Paris. And so they they did speak English, but more likely they were going to speak French to you. Mm. So that was a real, really good opportunity for experiencing. Yes, and that's kind of counter to Sweden, where you can literally survive on English alone. Yeah. If you really needed to. Well, that's pretty much what it is me throughout the entire experience. Well, it's, a it's a bit of a disservice you want. The only language well, attem- attempting, which I think is... It's, that's half of it, isn't it? Being able it to is. show that you want to And that's the whole point, I think. That's, a lot of British people get the, the negative kind of press on don't speak in another language or you don't, you don't try. Granted, Swedish is not the most widely spoken language, so it's not everyone you learn in school, like mm-hmm. French, Spanish, German. But I think there's a lot of us who still try and learn it and when everyone speaks English to you, even if you're not Swedish, if you're another first language speaker, be it Spanish or French, quite often... Those people who are you I know anyway who travel do know English. So mm-hmm. they'll speak to you in English mm-hmm. as well as rather than Swedish because their English is better than their Swedish mm-hmm. and I speak English. So speaking to most people, it's really hard to converse at all in Swedish until you get to the point where the other day you and I went for dinner and I asked if someone had a table for two, which they did, and they understand what I said. Then they followed up with another question and I was lost. <laughs> no idea what I said. <laughs> but it was uh, fun to try. And that's all part of it. It's having the confidence to try and that is easier said than done. And you really have to commit. throw yourself in. Mm. Commit to it, yeah. Just yes, you can dip your toe in the water, but if you can kind of plunge in and not not mind. It's like swimming in the sea, isn't it? I suppose you can't get to the <laughs> while swimming. <laughs> it's cold, but once you're in it, it's beautiful. Yeah, exactly. You <laughs> mean start swimming. <laughs> that was one of my experiences swimming. What well, an amazing thing to be able to do. Uh, as mm. when living abroad is of course being able to explore different cities around you that you, within the country so yeah that's a good point I think when you first came over for the first six weeks we spent four weekends somewhere else you know obviously we were in Spain first and Andorra and things but then when you came back we went to Copenhagen then to Oslo then to Stockholm mm-hmm. and yeah and you went to Andlerholm as well I think one weekend yes. or during the week Really took advantage of the trains. Yeah. And, I think well, learning the public transport is obviously a massive way of finding your independence mm-hmm. with ev- anywhere in the world, of course. But I think Sweden, for example, has like, excellent uh, public transport. And we've really taken advantage of the trains mm-hmm. in there. And the places. buses as well, to Oslo. Yeah. Coach. Oh, yeah, got the coach. Yeah. Yeah. So I think the interconnectivity of the cities mm-hmm. all over the Scandinavian region is really useful. Mm-hmm. I think... The UK has its flaws being very London centric. Like transport in London is fantastic. Mm. And certain parts of the UK where you've got good local transport, whether it's trams or, or like Liverpool's got a good underground train, which mm. goes to well, I can't say from its chest and things. But to get in between cities, it's really difficult when they ship a car, mm. especially now with all the strikes. It feels like here they've thought about it more and prioritised it as a form of transport. And I guess as well, the population is so much smaller compared to the size of the country to, for example, the UK. Yeah, but I don't mind. Just in terms of the, the sheer volume of mm. people. Yeah, it's a much bigger country in terms of size as well. And it's got relatively less money because it's got a much smaller working care population. Mm. 
So the UK should be much richer and be able to afford to travel or produce transport between cities much closer to the other. I guess they're so overpopulated in cities compared to the mm. in, in the UK. I think that's the story about that. Particularly in, for example, London is just saturated. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah London feels very lonely for a, for a city with more people in London's entire country. Mm. It's quite a scary thought. Um, yeah. And that was um, another thing, just uh, for it, just sort of comparing uh, experiences. Being in uh, Gothenburg and exploring the city, trams is just not really an experience that we I've had mm. being from the UK. It's not really a uh, yeah. thing, c- c- considering I've lived in mm. London, no, 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 which is all yeah. tube based. And there are Birmingham and Manchester have them, but again, it's not the same volume of trams. No. Less, yeah, and so. um, here the trail system good. is very much the is is is, is the um the, 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 is is the equivalent of the tube. Mm, yeah, and yeah. um yeah, it's just glorious the amount of time that you save yeah. <laughs> tram and tram and bike lanes, which yeah. and the scooters on bike lanes are much safer. I know scooters exist in the UK and yeah, everywhere else things, but you haven't got the, the designated spaces to use them. Mm. But it's weird because you see people on mopeds or you know motorized scooters in these lanes. Like you should not be there. You're not. You're not going the speed limit. <laughs> what are you? Anything else you want to add on about living in a, in these countries? I suppose maybe Sweden a bit more about your first impressions of here. It's probably a bit harder because you didn't know as many people the first time anyway. I think yes, it's a very different experience because I think often if you are going to live abroad, there's usually a pull, a pull, which would be it's for work, it's for studying, it could be for a partner, but where I fall into category. Mm. But often you might have your own work in place, which is a bit more stable or mm. allows you to be, uh, maybe you have transfer in your own work. And that was a big thing for being here was I ended up spending a lot of time alone. And I think it it's harder when your things that are totally out of your control can alter your experience for example we went in september turning into october and november and as you know it gets very dark very quickly in mm-hmm. yeah it's usually getting into the end of october it gets dark mm-hmm. yeah like three o'clock and i was sort of looking out the window going i need to go out because i'm not gonna see daylight mm-hmm. today um i've been working at um, it's interesting though i think people you're, you're in quite a neutral situation where you would you come to, to visit me for a long period of time six weeks this, this time the first time whereas i guess if, if you're moving for a partner you weren't moving permanently which there is a drive and even if you haven't got a job when you first arrive you're job hunting and that's mm-hmm. your your I guess your priority is finding some some work yeah and or then you're likely to family. yeah you're likely to have found work in six weeks mm-hmm. Or at least make connections through doing that so you might be able to socialize more i guess for you you didn't have any interest in finding work here because you weren't going to work here because you had the visa mm-hmm. um so that removes i don't know four hours a day worth of effort which you otherwise would have would have spent your know, job hunting or being around and there's only so many times you can walk around the city in six weeks to to replace it with i think we're very lucky that you've got a very good friend who lives only four hours on the bus away or by, by train away who we actually saw this weekend in malmo um and that was quite a saving grace. And every time you come, I guess we'll try and meet up with, with certain people who live in the, in the region for that reason. So it kind of wakes up and gives up a reason to come. I think, yeah, you know, if you were going to move for your partner and you were moving fully, it might be a bit easier because you have that drive to find work. Well, I guess you're fully committing to oh, yeah. the experience. And for me, there was always the pull of, being all the yeah the the, the being, the, being caught mm-hmm. between the two um the the post yeah. I'm sort of going okay well I'm still working for work at home mm. and I can't find the work in Sweden because I'm you know not, as you said I'm not allowed because you know I'm on a work visa and so yeah you, you do feel in this in, in this limbo and um it doesn't feel so much your uh, your journey and it's, it's not my home and that kind of thing and whereas if you were moving permanently you might be moving into a home together with more of that feeling of sort of um, stability or um individuality i suppose as well and your own choice of certain things and, mm-hmm. and, 
having a space which is okay when you're sharing it with someone but it's still yours mm. um, which is yeah, difficult um, I mean it's difficult for me as well because I was at work knowing that you were by yourself and having to make sure that we had stuff to do and found things and um, even like a key to the house like my phone the key of my the key to where I live is on my phone <laughs> I think that's a very individual experience well, it might become more popular in the future with technology right? yeah, so, I, don't, I don't know if it should well, it's really, yes. really, because my, my, so my key is my phone, which works like um, Apple Pay or Google Pay, whatever. And it's on your phone, now. Yeah, it's on my phone, but it works the same as Google Pay, in that it's an NFC signal. And for that to work, I need battery on my phone. So when I first moved, I had it on one phone. Look, I have a work phone, which I put a key on. And then you had one on your phone when you came the first time around, um, which we were able to transfer onto Evie's phone. But, you know, when I first moved, I, I had it on one phone. and I was literally limited for when I would go out with friends to get back before my phone died or I didn't have anywhere to sleep that night. <laughs> so, and constantly when you were about charging your phone. Mm. I think that's another thing here. Sweden's very forward, uh, in, into the future forward thinking. Mm. And they're extremely tech savvy and they're also very tech heavy in terms of how you, works right now. Exactly how you function in the society. It's mm. like um, Swish, for example. I think. Yeah, it's just uh, yeah, a thing I talked about it in my uh, previous episode that I was doing myself. Um, but it's, yeah, just to recap, it's so to get Swish, and Swish is like, you know how you have Monzo, you have your address book, and see who else has got Monzo, and you can send money to them quite quickly. And the UK bank transfers are instantaneous. Mm-hmm. In Sweden, they're not, if you want to send money to someone's bank, it takes a few days, and it's doing banking. It's very much care about people working when they work. Mm-hmm. It's just a slower pace of life mm-hmm. with certain things. But Swish is a way around that where it's linked to your bank account that you've put on the app and it will send money to a phone number, Swedish phone number, um, to send the money. And you can, it verifies who it is and you have mobile bank, bank ID, which is a, a face recognition to say, yes, this is you sending the money to this person mm-hmm. and it's all approved. Um, but to get that, you need to have a Swedish phone number, you need to have a a Swedish bank account, you need to have bank ID to get a bank ID, you need to have a bank account. To get a bank account, you need to have a personal number. To get a personal number, you need to have a visa. That's the cat. <laughs> to get a visa, you need to have a job. Uh, and be here for more than a year. Yeah, it's so, so difficult to get out of there. But once you're in, it's great. But it just takes a long time to get in. Mm-hmm. But it works. You know, As an integrated system, it's very efficient. But getting into the system is a bit of a nightmare. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. But, yeah. So yeah, I'd say it's it's very tech heavy. Um, so you can you do feel as if you have to have every app they have, but even for travel with them, what's it called? Bus traffic. Oh, it? bus traffic. Yeah, yeah, for the bus and the travel, you can get a card. I don't know what you where you can buy it, but I know people have it. The bus card. Mm. Maybe buy it. The must be like the bus central station might sell it or something. But people have prepaid cards and things, and you have your like metro card in New York. Mm. But the app is much easier, I think. And then you can link that to your own account, but to get that, you need bank ID yeah. or a person number, <laughs> which is a bit again, annoying. Um, but you can pay for that just with a credit card or bank card, but you can't mm-hmm. sign in and have an account. Um, yeah, it's more, more heavy. Minefield. It's definitely a minefield. <laughs> but I think we've kind of exhausted section two of being here now. <laughs> Welcome to section three of the podcast, which is kind of a review. I haven't really named it, actually. It should really name it. But it's a review of, of, I guess, what we've talked about, but also your experiences. I know we're still kind of exploring Sweden and grow. Well, maybe we'll do a review of this in a few months to see how it's evolved. Have you moved here? Do you know? <laughs> and uh, just any advice you want to give to people who are looking to live abroad, I guess, mainly about your, your, your experience in France. What would you do to, or how would you advise people who were looking to do a semester abroad? Mm-hmm. You know, what, what what tips would you give? I think, from my experience, which granted hasn't been uh, living abroad for a, a longer period than, than three months, mm. I think doing something if you can do it, do it in education is such such a privilege and such a fantastic way of experiencing 
another culture and mm. country. And you know, if if you went to university, for example, you can do uh, summers abroad. You can do years abroad. You can do Erasmus. Do a, a swap with another um, another university that's um, that's the, you know, the affiliate university, for example. But that's not what I did. Mine was a very separate mm. um, thing, and. It just meant that I really got to have that experience of uh, an, an, another culture, another opportunity, but without having a massive commitment because it was only for those three months. Mm. And it was with the uh, idea of being progressing my career because it uh, ultimately doing that course enabled me to then audition for drama school and get in mm. to then carry on in my career as an actress. Because if I hadn't done that, I don't know if I would have had the skills to get in the first time round because of what because they were teaching us what to what the, the panels are looking for when they're auditioning mm. you. And it just meant that you were given the Yeah, well you were given the tools mm. to know how to best present yourself and, and feel the least nervous going in so that you can do your best work. Because we are I think we're so so much of our so our true selves and true ability is clouded by nerves. Mm-hmm. And having the ability to control those nerves by first being able to acknowledge them and then having the tools in your toolkit to tackle those and overcome your nerves and turn them from nerves into, okay, this is just an excitement, this is just my... Well, exactly, it's the same response right? your body. Yeah. Nervousness and excitement. So yeah. your body... You can trick your body. Receives it, it's the same thing. Yeah. So, yeah, it's all psychological. Yeah, it? yeah, exactly. And so, yeah, you can alter the, the narrative. Mm. And say, no, this is just showing that I care about this and I can go in with that drive and best foot forward. And so that's what ultimately what that allowed me to do because uh, every week we had audition prep, for example. Mm. Um, and also we were just being fully immersed in drama school experience because we were ultimately it was like doing a semester of drama school. Yeah. And they're just um, isolated on its own. So, yeah, I think that's a fantastic way of getting to experience another culture and see whether you might like to do it in the future, but live there, or just to even be able to have that. I'm interested with, with Erasmus now, as you mentioned, since, since Brexit, how it's going to work mm-hmm. if it's available. I've not looked into it because I've got an education mm-hmm. anymore, but it would be a shame if it's no longer available mm-hmm. or easily available for a lot of students because. As you said, a lot of, a lot of my friends have done it as well, uh, who are actually be on this podcast. Um, and you said you kind of done a similar thing. Obviously, it's not the same organisation, but it's a semester studying abroad. Mm-hmm. So it kind of has, has you know significant parallels to that kind of um, program. Mm-hmm. How hard it will be for students of British universities who were not European to go and study abroad in in Europe mm-hmm. because of because of uh, yeah. the decision we made in twenty sixteen. No, yeah, it's. I, I, I don't know, because even going back to the three-week summer school that I did, the, mm. the span of countries that, nationalities. and nationalities that were taking the course, it, it was massive. People from all over the world came mm. to do these three weeks, and what an incredible opportunity that we were all having, mm. getting to uh, live in live in London for three weeks, for example, if you were from Brazil or the States or wherever. Mm. And, um, yes, they might not be affected too much because they're not European, but no. still... But, yeah, sorry. Um, so I, but I, I wonder if it will, if it means that it's not so easy, or if it will deter. Or maybe they'll go somewhere else to a school in, in France, or in the UK, because it's. But a lot of those, a, a, a lot of the people who were up on the course with me, who were from, from elsewhere, who were studying for those three weeks, that have went on to then either go to drama school in the UK mm. or just even kind of live in the UK. So it's quite interesting that maybe they came to those three weeks and, and right, loved yeah. it enough to want to come and spend some more more of their time there, mm-hmm. like a, a considerable amount more time in the And help well. prop up the drama school industry of yeah. the UK and, and showcase the amazing talent pool we have here. Uh, I guess, I don't know how actually you might have done a lot more, but since since the decision to leave the European Union, has the drama school in the UK kind of dropped in standard or have they remained the same or is there much information around it? Because I guess if you've not got the same pool of talent coming in, mm-hmm. Well, statistic at the moment because of uh, COVID, a lot of drama schools have actually had to close because mm. they haven't been able to stay open. And it's, I think, it's a subject which is hard to do online and you need exactly. that intimacy. Well, it's, it's devastating to think that I think there's been about three or four drama schools that have had to close in these mm. last two years, which is quite a, a big statistic yeah. in the yeah, industry. I guess we're still experiencing the hangover of, mm. of, of both those, mm. those kind of compound issues mm. for, for both 
the UK especially. <laughs> and then I think... <laughs> we digress. <laughs> we, we, well, it's quite interesting to people. But going back to, to advice then, obviously you've moved or spent significant time in a foreign country for your partner, me. Um, oh. <laughs> <laughs> what, what advice would you give to someone who's doing a similar thing? Because obviously, it's not. We, we we know it's not easy. We acknowledge there's difficulties and there's going to be you know uh, sensitive subjects between both of you. And mm-hmm. You and I are quite, I think, are quite mature <laughs> and open. So yeah. We can talk about a lot of different things and not afraid to express when one of us is upset or something or struggling. But what advice may you give to to a couple, be it the either partner uh, traveling for for someone else i think if you can research where you're going and be as prepared in terms of knowing the the layout of the area the what do you like to do do you like to do dance classes do you want to learn the language do you want do do, do you like art do you like sport Mm. find out what you can do that's in your life already that makes you feel uh, have to have that sense of fun that sense of release that exercise the that learning whatever it is you love to do and how can you bring those elements of your life that are going to ultimately bring joy and help with your mental health how can you bring that into the place that you're going to be mm. moving to if you can research restaurants coffee places the, where the library is where the museums banks are, are where museums are uh, what you're where you're living walking tours yeah school. anything like that to just to i think you know knowledge is powerful as we know, and being prepared is the thing that's going to, I think, make you feel, I would have thought, make, make, made you feel more in control of going mm. into it. I think as well, knowing that even with all of that, it's not nothing can prepare you for the experience of being in a totally different country. And being alone for a lot of the days as well. Yeah, yeah. Structure, I think, is the big takeaway. Yeah, for you, well. having focus on, on some work projects was, was helpful. Definitely. Whenever I get, yeah, my, with my work, it's very um, ebb and flow with, you know, feast and famine in terms of the workload that you can mm. have at any given time. And uh, within the time that I was here, I had some weeks where I was really having to self-motivate the work to keep pushing forward, whether it be looking for different people to be writing to, whether it was auditioning, applying for certain things. Mm. And then I had other weeks when I had multiple self-tapes and um, auditions that I had to do, prepping for um, which is filled filming. up all day. Yeah, which... And like, you're leaving sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I really, every single time we decided to go away for the weekend, I never again. Exactly. <laughs> it's yeah. yeah, there's, there's a thing about, um, I don't know what else has got uh, a significant other in, in the creative industry. You'll always find out that every time you book to go away somewhere, they'll get an audition or a project or something. So, so be, be constantly... have a tripod with you at all times. Yeah. Have some some blank canvas literally <laughs> to film against and be prepared for holding cameras and, and giving feedback and yeah that's what my uh i guess actors significant others supporters group i just started doing that online this you know tips for, hey, so. tips for significant others of creatives or something you know, how to survive <laughs> because yeah it's not like a standard vocation it's completely different and yeah, the, the work days just are very different. Well, yeah, my work days are long from, from testing, but mm. it's still, yeah, it's a big difference with the stress of what you do. But I guess one, one, one thing which um, you, you could see coming here is when we're well, well, working away and I'm not here, is like a writing retreat if you are here for a length of time, because you know a lot of people do tend to go to remote locations or places of beauty, which we are more than, um, you know, uh, Surrounded by on mm. the coast of Sweden, it's beautiful mm. to do a writing retreat or yeah. some kind of soul searching. Or yeah, change, again, I'm going to change your mindset, isn't it? Okay, what's this for? What can I use the best time with? And I think um, that's definitely something going forward. I know the first time, uh, I think it was very much just even finding my feet. Well, I think it so was so too long for us. Yeah, probably because just in terms of not having, not having, as I was saying, those things in place to create the structure. Um, and I think I, being more experienced of having, saying about research, I did, don't think I did enough research into the things I could do for myself that would mm. be to fill, fill my own time yeah. um, in the evenings, for example, because you have your own um, things in the evenings of sports that you were doing. Yeah. And um, because I was there for a limited time, it felt like a lot of the stuff that I'd found, 
I couldn't sign into the time the I needed. Commitment for weeks and stuff. Exactly. Yeah. But that's not to say it's not out there, it's just being a little bit more, even more savvy with the new research. Um, you know, research structure. <laughs> and um, I think being very gentle with yourself as well and knowing that it's okay to have feeling very uh, like you have the rug stuck in the of you and feeling at, at odds. It's, a, that's, it's very natural because you are in a totally different scenario, place, and all of your things that, that make you feel in the comfort zone are not there because you're yeah. literally out on out of the comfort zone in terms of your what world is not the same. Mm, completely. As it is in your well, which can be quite sobering or quite nice thing to change, but the longer you can do that, the harder it can be, or the you miss things naturally. Mm. All right, well, that's very interesting. Thank you. Thank you for that, and thank you for the advice to people and support. You're welcome. One more thing that I'd love to do, you especially as well, but here yeah, is Park Run. Oh, yeah, that's, yeah, that's yeah, really important. Yeah. Saturday. You know what Park Run is? It's a week, uh, every Saturday, someone, very, very gratefully or graciously, uh, hosts a Park Run where they send up, and there's a heap of volunteers who do an amazing job every week. Um, in local areas, it's very British. I think you look at the maps; it seems to be mainly where people who are British live mm. uh, all over the world. Um, but we have two in Sweden, in, in Gothenburg, sorry, not in Sweden, it's quite a few in Sweden. Um, but they're all over the world. Um, and on Saturdays at about nine o'clock or nine thirty here or nine fifteen, mm. times on in, on the continent do change a lot more than in the UK, where it's nine o'clock or not. <laughs> Actually, it's coming with 9.30. We've got that early. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, it's a 5k run, a walk, um, very social. It's not about winning or running your PB. It's all about just getting some exercise and seeing some, some beautiful scenery. You know, we've done, I'm, I'm nearly on 50, I think, now. You are 24 or something like that. All over the country when you were touring for your previous job. And we've done some in Stockholm, mm -hmm. Copenhagen, Gotham. <laughs> Yeah, and you you get to meet people, and usually meet people who are, who are British. Yeah, I was so say. if you're if you're British, then you can get good tips, hints. Mm -hmm. And it's and it's a free thing, to, a free event, yeah. which is wonderful on a Saturday. So if you're feeling like you haven't seen any people that you can just have mm. a chat with, it's a really great way of suddenly feeling incredibly connected and part of a community and doing a little bit of exercise. Mm. Is, and in the one in Gothenburg, you score pass. It's a definitely bouncing run. So I was sounding Scottish. Scratch house. Um, well, the, the lady who runs it is Scottish. Oh, um, yeah. <laughs> uh, I did actually hear Swedish spoken in a Scottish accent, which I was amazed at how great this lady in Swedish, yeah. Swedish was. But it was just like, it's definitely a Scottish accent. It's like Jeannie Murray doing Swedish. <laughs> um, but after after the, the park run, they always go to Fika, mm. which Fika is the best invention ever. It's in Swedish. Well, it's not really an invention. It's <laughs> just coffee and cake. It's, it's coffee and cake. But it's done more seriously. It's like yeah. afternoon tea. But, but it was the, every concept, the concept is, yeah. is a great invention of yeah. how committed we are to... Yeah, I didn't care. work. Like every, well, most days, especially on Fridays, but most days people will go and sit down and have coffee and a, a snack or something in the afternoon and just talk. Not about work, which is wonderful. I really like that. Yeah, so you can see people afterwards. After yeah, and, and that's where you can get, get, get the advice and get questions and meet people. And, yeah, there's a lot of tourism as well with park rooms. The other thing that, uh, since being here, uh, that you've joined is, and I'm now on it as well, is the Facebook group. Um, oh, yeah. It's in Gothenburg, and that, I, I, yeah. did, I did, once I Pretty joined well. that, I did suddenly feel a lot more connected to the number of people that were living in Gothenburg who are British. Yeah. So all asking questions. You know, so that's just any 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 kind of page. Well, I've asked questions a few times on the Facebook group, and you get answers like yeah. same same days. Literally, I was trying to watch the rugby, <laughs> and I posted the question saying, "Hello, does anyone know where I can watch the rugby in the city?" Um, and they said, "Oh yeah, go to the um, Flying Barrel." Pub off the yeah. avenue, mm -hmm. and I went over, and it was full of full of British people, and it was really good fun. It could have good atmosphere. It's like being at home. I was like, oh, I never felt like a, and it's that kind of. It's always good to have that kind of place to feel at home when you're abroad. Definitely, nice segue into some 
having the page to then going to certain places and mm. certain events. That... Yeah, we're finding yeah, certain things which do remind you of them, mm. which are quite handy to have. That's mm. a good tip as well. Yeah. And lastly, I think using meetup. Um, I've used it a couple of times to go on walks and play frisbee golf and stuff. So what is Meetup? It's an app where it's kind of like an events app, but you join a group based on a um, a common interest, be it language, be it... There's a few book clubs on there, which I'll be meaning to do and try, and I've showed you them previously, obviously heavily interested in literature, um, much better than I am at doing that stuff. So I think you probably enjoy... Um, and a great way to meet people, yeah. but also they have hiking and photography, and all over the world they have. They have. So Meetup is an app where, yeah, people in your in, in your area just make a group and go. Mm-hmm. I want to do or get involved in photography. Okay, I set up an event saying let's go walk around the city taking pictures. So every the first week of the month, there's a photography group which go around North and take pictures every month. Mm-hmm. It's beautiful. You can see how this really changes throughout the year. Yeah, just being around, isn't it? Yeah, and you make good friends from it, which is I did even to reason why. Yeah. We are social creatures, that's all. Mm-hmm. Are we? <laughs> and do yes. <laughs> that's some year as well. <laughs> Time of day. <laughs> Am I hungry? I'm getting me. <laughs> Don't talk to me. <laughs> that's perfect. <pleasant. laughs> well that kind of concludes <laughs> section three. Right, so thank you Lee, for Humoring me by being on this podcast. You're welcome, James. <laughs> I guess helping tell stories of living abroad and uh, sharing the trials and tribulations of of expat life and and yeah, ho- ha- or hopefully inspiring to be able to do the same thing. Giving some advice if you are looking to move abroad or are actually moving abroad. Hopefully you've got some insight into what it's like or some tips or just some humour, maybe. You know, I listen to podcasts about parenting and haven't got any kids, but I find it hilarious. <laughs> that kind of thing. I hope you have... I um, say distance. Yeah, yeah. I hope you've um, yeah, either found it entertaining or found some nugget of information which has given you um, a great uh, tip for for your future endeavours, should it be abroad, or even in your own city, or even just travelling, you know, great tips you've given about walking tours and knowing where you're going, okay, it's a sense of wanting to be adventurous, but also having that foresight and doing a bit of planning is always beneficial, no matter if it's a short bit of holiday or vacation or semester, that's all kind of thing. Um, or if you're moving um, semi-permanently or permanently to another place, yeah, it's been great having you. Uh, just expand that and and really uh, unlock you know it's I have in my head as well through this conversation which I really appreciate so thank you you're welcome thank you very much for having me yeah. and if you've found 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 some insight into this podcast then please let us know please um, get in touch on social media or leave a comment or leave a five star review on Spotify or pod, uh, Apple Podcasts right, so, so we can well yeah because that's how you grow <laughs> just follow whoever else does on podcasts <laughs> only five stars are there only <laughs> um, but yeah in all seriousness if you have found some information or you want to ask a question you know I have uh, lined up quite a few friends of mine and, and colleagues to be on this and talk about what they've done and how they've moved abroad from all over the world if you have any advice or want me to talk about something in the future or bring up a, um, a topic, I do. if enough come in, I do plan doing an FAQ-based episode, just going through loads of questions that have come in from, from you amazing people listening and supporting this kind of uh, endeavour of mine. Um, yeah, which actually is another thing about living abroad. Is I started this podcast because my evenings are very much void uh, when because my... My girlfriend lives abroad and my family live abroad, so my social life is quite, um, I guess, narrow. You know, with a handful of great people, but they're not always free. So, you can't play, you can't, can't play sports every night. No, well, if, <laughs> You're doing very well, if so I could, I would, yeah. but uh, it's probably not. Uh, I would end up not eating this. <laughs> um, so, yeah, having a passion project like this is, has been something which has been great for me. Um, so, yeah. If you have found something useful in this, please let me know. Please get in touch. I am on all social media. Um, this account. 
which I'll own in the show notes. And I hope to see you next time.